Well, it's about damn time. Hello, I'm Bob Smirfak, but not really. This series is designed for theological seminary students with approaching exams who have not had time to read the Bible, and for the Amish, if they can find a way to watch YouTube without electricity. Matthew chapter 25, let's go. In this chapter, Jesus works hard and fast to get a few more parables off the launch pad. He said, okay, next, let's look at God's program like it was a team of girls who've never had sex before. And they all carried flashlights to go out in the dark and meet up with a dude who was about to get married. In this story, virgins came in two types, those with good common sense and those who did stupid stuff. And the demographic here was split pretty much down the middle. The dumb ones had flashlights, but no extra batteries. But the forward planners were fully stocked on backup Duracells. Now, apparently the husband-to-be wasn't as punctual as some grooms, so the whole team of virgins nodded off and caught some Zs. But 12 a.m. rolled around and someone started screaming about how the guy was finally showing up, and they needed to haul ass to catch a glimpse of Mr. Wright. So the sexually uninitiated women jumped up and pointed their flashlights, but the dimmer half of the group said to the brighter half, Hey, slide us a little extra battery because we got no juice here. The brainy girl said, That's your problem. We didn't bring enough batteries for all of us. Hit the convenience store and get your own. So they took off to make a battery run, but before they got back, the tardy future husband rolled up and the girls with the spare batteries followed him into his late-night nuptial ceremony, and that door slammed shut behind them. But then the other Vestal younglings ran back from the store, and they wanted in. They yelled for the marrying man to pop the latch, but the groom shouted from inside, I gotta be honest, I have no idea who you are. So Jesus unveiled the moral of the story. Keep your eyes peeled, because the date and time of my comeback is going to be a shocker. JC may have been on a tight schedule because he didn't even let off the gas before he launched the next parable. Heaven, Incorporated was like a guy jetting off to a remote locale, and before he headed out he called a staff meeting and handed out his assets. He handed the first employee a Lincoln, he spotted the second one a Jefferson, and the third guy got a Washington. Each employee got seed money equivalent to his particular level of financial savvy. Then the boss split town. So the guy who got the Lincoln went out and hustled, and came back with two Lincolns. Or a Hamilton, if you prefer. Same with Mr. Jefferson. He hustled around and wound up with a pair of Jeffersons. But Mr. Washington took the no-risk option with the boss's cash. He opened up a no-interest FDIC-insured checking account. Fast forward through the calendar and the head honcho comes in for a landing and looks to square up with his boys. The first dude stepped up and showed off his Lincolns. He said, boss, you spotted me five and check this out. Now I've got ten. The boss gushed. Way to go, you model employee. You've kicked ass with limited responsibilities. I'm putting you in charge of some major shit. Step into my office and make yourself at home. Then Mr. Jefferson said, Sir, you gave me a couple of bucks and I'm hitting you back with four. So the boss said it again. Model employee, ass kicker, step into my office. Now it's Mr. Washington's turn. He said, here's the thing, boss. Seeing as you're a total type A guy, I mean the kind of guy who expects to harvest fields you didn't even plant, for crying out loud. I was a little intimidated. I deposited your money and then guess what? When you got back, I withdrew it. So here you go. But the boss went loco on him. You worthless, indolent, peon. You were fully aware I harvest fields I didn't even plant, for crying out loud. You should have at least dropped it in a savings account and accrued a little interest for me. So he said, take the Washington from this guy and pass it over to the double Lincoln guy. Ipso facto. Any dude who's got a little something is going to walk away with more than he can carry. And any dude who's empty-handed is going to be even more empty-handed. Then he fired the guy. He fired him so bad the guy ended up in a place that didn't have any lights and you could hear people despairing and biting out their own dental fillings. So Jesus told them that when he makes his re-entry in unprecedented style, which will include a contingent of every celestial player on the roster, not just the starters, then he's going to plop down on the most impressive seat in the house. Next, every person in the world is going to line up in front of him and he's basically going to make like a shepherd and divide the flock up. To that end, apparently there's only two kinds of people in this world, Ovisaries and Capra Agagras, and they're going to get sorted out right and left, respectively. That's his right, not your right when you're facing him. So don't get any ideas and try to slide over to your left when he gives the word. Dude knows a sheep from a goat. Then the dictator's going to say to everybody on his right, come on down you people who got in good with the father part of myself and cash in that lottery ticket that's had your name on it since day one. Because I was famished, and you served me up some roasted flesh. I was parched, and you handed me a beverage. You had no idea who I was, and you said, come on in. I was nude, and you weren't having that. You made sure I got dressed. I came down with something, and you stopped by with the chicken soup. I was doing time, and you dropped in on visitor's day. 
So ostensibly, he was a starving, dehydrated nobody without any clothes, but with plenty of germs and a rap sheet to boot. But then he told them that these do-gooders were going to be all, ah, shucks, and they would say, hold on, when did we ever hook you up with food, water, shelter, clothes, chicken soup, and prison visits? And the guy in the big chair is going to shoot back, I really mean it. Whenever you hooked up one of the lowest schmucks on the totem pole, you were hooking me up. But then he's going to turn to the people who just found out they weren't human beings, but goats. And he's going to tell those assholes to get lost and take a flying leap into an eternal flame worse than the 1989 Bengals hit. If that's possible. Whatever it was, it was a place specially tricked out for the guy with the horns and his entourage. Because I was famished, and you weren't there with the roasted flesh. I could have really used a drink, but no. You didn't know me, and so you didn't even answer the door. I was nude, coughing up my spleen, and in jail, and you never showed. But the lefties, members of genus Capra, were going to argue, Hey, hold up there, refresh our memory. At what juncture did we ever run into you when you were emaciated, arid, new in town, all natural, under the weather, or incarcerated, and not hook you up? And he'd say, for real, people, if you didn't hook up a common jerk, you didn't hook up your boy. So the bearded, straight-horned lefties were all going down through the trap door for some round-the-clock torture. But the woolly ruminants over to the right, his right, were all taking the big space elevator to a Disneyland that never closes. And that was the end of that chapter. Next in this series, we'll move on to chapter 26. Spoiler alert. The top-ranking priest, Caiaphas, holds a death panel where they vote yes on killing Jesus, but no on doing it over the holiday weekend. Because that would just piss people off. As always, I'm not a religious figure, but if you want me to save you or damn you to hell, I'll do my best. 